Welcome back to the National Arts Club. I am a member here, uh, so I was really happy to talk to them. As you know, we came back over here. The service over next door was a little spotty, to say the least. The financial situation next door is really spotty, and we wanted to make sure that we, A, had good food and good service, and at the same time, we're sure to have a place uh, for our upcoming meetings. And uh, we wish them well, but they need to get their house in order. This one went through a few traumas about three to four years ago, but boy, they got their act together beautifully, and there is a professional management team here. Uh, John Aramo, standing right over here, is the manager of the club. Thank you, John, for making everything work easily. Uh, we have a lovely arrangement, and happily, we didn't have to raise our prices to any of you, because we know that that really, really matters. Um, I would like to just say a couple of things. We had our board meeting. We always have a board meeting at 10.30 in the morning before these meetings. And um, it was a good meeting. There is a lot of good, there are a lot of good things happening. Uh, we are reviewing the awards program and Mike Blumen, um, Ralph Blumenthal and Michael Serrell teamed up this summer to review the awards program that we have to make it even better and smoother for entrance as well as those of us who judge it and they presented a very fine report there will be there was board input there will be some revisions and you will be hearing more about that in the coming months uh, David Andelman was elected to the board. Uh, David, some of you may know, he uh, is editor and publisher of World Policy Journal and a member of the Board of Contributors at USA Today, and he previously served as an executive editor of Forbes and was a domestic and foreign correspondent of the New York Times, and he was uh, a president of the Overseas Press Club. So he's joining our board. We are thrilled to have him. He happens to be in Paris at the moment. What a shame. But he'll be back in a couple of days at any rate. Uh, and the other thing I would like to say, have, have any of you looked at our website recently? Oh, you've got to go on www silurians.org. Very simple. Uh, go there because Mort Scheinman and Ben Petrusky have updated it with the help of Fred Herzog, who is our guru, fabulous uh, tech guru, who has been doing all of this for the club. And it looks good. It has nice links now to other journalism sites that you might want to check out sometime. And we are also going to be posting the links to all of the videos of our past speakers that we have up there. This is uh, about to happen. And uh, so there's going to be a lot that you might want to check out that you may have missed if you couldn't have gotten to a meeting. So it's good. The other thing is um, uh, we have been working to get more of you onto our Facebook page. You'll hear more about that. Barbara Lovenheim and Bill Deal have worked to get more things on a Facebook page for members and a few other people who are friends so that things that happen, like over the summer when we learned that Mar Marlene Sanders had passed away, uh, and then we heard that Sandy Sokolow's uh, memorial service and Marlene's were posted. It's an easy way to get this information out there and you can comment and, you know, news about members can go back and forth very nicely there. So I would urge you to sign on to our Facebook page. I will tell you that um, I'm going to send out some more information about how do I do that because a lot of people haven't a clue. So we understand that this is not necessarily a tech up-to-date crowd. Uh, so we're going to try to provide a little help. And you'll hear more from that. We'll get it out to you online. Other than that, uh, enjoy your lunch. Uh, you're going to have a different kind of dessert today. And the big change is that, you know, we always used to have those real gooey desserts and things next door. But some of us. Some of us, particularly females, uh, didn't much like paying for something we really couldn't eat or shouldn't eat. And so here we're going to have a choice. We've got, we're going to get big trays of fresh fruits and 
the very popular homemade cookies at the National Arts Club, and in which there will be chocolate. So that we will, yes, there will be our our various board members would kill me if there wasn't something chocolate and gooey in there. So uh, I hope you enjoy that. You can do light or you can do heavy as you see fit. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, we'll be back uh, at 1 o'clock or shortly thereafter with our guest speaker, Matt Winkler. And uh, he is here. And um, enjoy. See you soon. In the future, in the future, uh, if some of you, if we're having fish as the main course and some of you really can't stand fish, uh, there, you can always quietly ask the server. There are always vegetarian entries available. So we will make sure that there are enough for you. Uh, just, just letting you know that. Um, I mean, obviously for a banquet, it's hard to prepare six zillion choices, but we do, we do one, but there, for people who really can't Oh, you're not allowed to have cell phones in the club. I mean, turn it off. Anyway, but now I want to get on to the main event. We are really honored to have someone with us who I'm sure needs no introduction. Uh, you've heard about Matt Winkler for a number of years. He is that mild-mannered reporter <clears throat> who uh, at one point in time, it was 1990, was it? Was it 1990? He was covering finance for the Wall Street Journal, and he got a call from somebody that he had interviewed, who was this mogul named Michael Bloomberg. And Bloomberg said to him, um, I want to launch a news organization. And Matt said to him, what? <laughs> or something of that sort. But I'm going to let him tell you the story, because I, I remember way back when I was reading a story in the New York Times and there was this credit Bloomberg and I said what is that? Well the rest is history. Matt will tell you a little bit about how that got started in a time when as we all know all the other major news organizations in the universe or certainly in this country were cutting back closing bureaus and uh, firing a lot of good people. And it was a depressing time, actually, to see what was going on. And then there was Bloomberg. And here is the man who made it happen, Matt Winkler. Thank you, Betsy. And it is uh, really an honor and a delight and a privilege to be here because so many of you are uh, former colleagues, um, some mentors, um, people uh, who I have to say uh, were so um, helpful to me in my life that I wouldn't be here standing before you if uh, they hadn't uh, helped me along the way. And. Uh, Here's hoping I can acknowledge some of you in the course of uh, telling a little bit of the tale. Uh, I, know, I know you probably want to know what I'm doing now to keep busy, uh, and I'll happily uh, oblige. But let me just uh, add a little, a little to what uh, Betsy said, um, how it all started um, at Bloomberg. And actually, truth be told, it actually started at the Wall Street Journal, um, where um, in the 80s, I think I was probably the happiest reporter working there. And uh, one of my um, great fortunes was that I had uh, Paul Steiger as an editor. And he's here, actually. Uh, and um, he actually figures in this story, because uh, I was, in the 80s, um, one of the few people, I think, at the Wall Street Journal uh, who loved writing about markets, loved writing about uh, the Wall Street at Wall Street. Um, and uh, in the course of my reporting, I, I came across um, in London um, this little box that sat on the desks of uh, then traders at Merrill Lynch. Um, and the box was so informative to the people who I considered my sources 
uh, I had to find out what was inside the box, and of course the box was then known as the Bloomberg, and it was um, much smaller than it is today. And uh, one thing it did, which really frightened me, uh, was it revealed the relative values in markets at least three or four weeks before any of us at the Wall Street Journal would get around to writing about it. Now, it was all math, but it was still to someone like me who thought, you know, uh, he had died and gone to heaven, was working for the Yankees, that uh, this was a real threat. And um, as I got closer to uh, Bloomberg and I got closer to New York, it's now 1987, a fateful year. I'm back uh, from London, and I discovered to my horror that the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones, uh, no fault of its own, had decided after decades of sourcing treasury bond prices and yields to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, it was now going to have this service provided by Bloomberg at no extra charge. The only thing that was stipulated is that Bloomberg got to have his name at the bottom of the three pages that had all the treasury bond prices and yields in the Wall Street Journal. I was horrified by this because knowing Bloomberg as I did at that point, and if you cut me back then, my blood was Dow Jones red. Um, one of my uh, former colleagues, Larry Armour, uh, can, can testify to that. Uh, we were just catching up, and I think he took one of the photos of me in my early years uh, writing uh, about markets, and it's in a Dow Jones brochure to this day. So there is proof of that, of what I say. But anyway, back to uh, this story. Uh, the reason why I was horrified is because, uh, well, one, Dow Jones at the time owned about two-thirds of a company called Tellerate, which was the system of choice in the bond market in the world. And so, you know, why would I, working for Dow Jones, want to be part of anything that helped even a small upstart that nobody had heard of called Bloomberg? But the reality was that the Fed in 1987 was still reluctant to automate everything it did. It refused to acknowledge the existence of zero coupon bonds. You remember back then in 87, we had 14% and 15% handles on bonds. Well, people took the bonds apart and they sold the principal and the interest separately. It was a big market and the Fed wouldn't provide any kind of data every day on this. So Bloomberg in his earliest years uh, running his company suggested to both the AP and Dow Jones who were partners getting this data that he could supply all of this stuff electronically in five seconds, not at 315 when it came from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, but at 515 and it would go into the front end of the Wall Street Journal, the AP, just like that, and they could get uh, zero coupon bonds as well and it wouldn't cost a dime. So this was an offer that uh, nobody at Dow Jones could refuse, and it was happily accepted. And I uh, complained, tried to complain at the time that this was a mistake, and uh, was just told to go back to my desk and keep working. About nine months later, I'm having a sandwich in the cafeteria at Dow Jones with a reporter who is a lifelong friend, Mike Miller, who's still at the Wall Street Journal. And he says to me, have you ever heard of this outfit called Bloomberg? And I said, have I heard of it? It was like Vesuvius erupting. And, uh, you know, and I told him about uh, relative value in markets, what's cheap, what's expensive, and that Bloomberg is doing this electronically, and worse, with our own newspaper, our own company. And Mike was unflappable and uh, brilliant, was one of the first technology reporters at the Wall Street Journal, turns to me and he says, you know, it sounds like this guy Bloomberg is doing with financial information what United Airlines and American Airlines did with their automated reservation systems in the 70s, getting people hooked on his data. And uh, as soon as Mike said that, I, Mike Miller said that, I, I said, you're absolutely right. This is his big story. We've got to do this story. And uh, literally on a napkin, we sketched out a uh, 
what was then sort of the typical proposal for page one. And page one had to go through Paul Steiger. And uh, years later, the original four paragraphs that we wrote as a proposal for this story were given back to me uh, You know, when I was at Bloomberg. Um, and what was remarkable about it is what we originally wrote at that lunch um, was pretty much untouched. A few, few tweaks here and there. Um, but that's 90% of how I got to Bloomberg because we wrote the story. Um, it was a difficult story to write because we had to write about our own company in a sense and write about a threat from an unknown uh, company that uh, few people in journalism or, or even uh, the financial industry really were aware of. And uh, Paul Steiger is the one who decided to run the story, so I give him credit for that. And then a year later, I told you I was the happiest reporter at the Wall Street Journal. A year later, I'm, I'm, I was the uh, securities industry reporter for the Wall Street Journal, which meant I covered the Wall Street and the Wall Street Journal. And I am having such a great time because every firm is in trouble. They're all going over the falls together. And, um, and it's, I don't know, the week, of, week before Thanksgiving, and Mike Bloomberg calls. And I had gotten to know him, obviously, because I had to report the story. It took about six, seven months to report and then finally get in the paper. And it's now, you know, uh, 15 months after that story is run. And he says, I need some advice. And I, knowing him as I did, I said, you don't need advice from anybody, let alone a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And he said, no, what would it take to get in the news business? And I did say, you? Well, just like that. Um, and he said, yeah. And as I thought about it at the time, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, if he could marry what he had done with data, and he had done something that actually no media company, believe it or not, but it's true, no media company had taken the data of the bond market and then eventually all these other markets, put it on a computer so that you could know what is today's price relative to yesterday's price and all the prices that preceded it. So you had some sense of whether something was worth a lot today or not. Uh, by the way, that's what journalists are supposed to do anyway, uh, relative value. And here was this uh, machine that was doing that. And what if that machine was then married to journalism at its best? And that got me thinking. And I know he had already thought about some of that. And so I said, well, if you could marry these two things together, you might have something that doesn't exist anywhere else. And remember back then, 1989, which is when we had the conversation, you know, journalism, especially business, economic, financial journalism, was delineated. It was had lots of dichotomies. You had the folks who did the staccato type, this just in headlines, otherwise known as news services, wire services. You had those who did once a day, once a week, um, platforms of journalism, otherwise known as newspapers and magazines. But you didn't have anyone doing both at the same time, really, with the same people. Context and perspective, real time, tomorrow's news today. And so, all of that was kind of percolating in this conversation with Bloomberg. Um, you know, my question to him, because I couldn't possibly tell him what it would take to get in the news business, and he still blames me because he says, you know, uh, one, I never m met a reporter I didn't want to hire. Um, and, uh, you know, in the early years of Bloomberg, the phone call I most often got from Mike Bloomberg was, without any introduction, you're going to put us out of business. So. I clearly didn't know anything about, you know, the, uh, the financial end of it. But what I did ask him at the time is, I said, well, look, suppose your reporter's writing a story about your biggest customer. It was Merrill Lynch at the time. And uh, the story says that the uh, CEO is absconded with $10 million. They're, he's skiing with his secretary in Rio. They're having a wonderful time together. The story is true. Uh, and you get a call from the chairman who says, um, you know, if you don't remove that story from your Bloomberg, all, all of your Bloombergs, that is, they will all disappear from our trading floor tomorrow. And I said, Mike, what do you do? And he smiled at me, he said, my lawyers will love you. And I said, well, that's 
Good answer. That's the right answer. And he said, okay, fine. I'm going to do it. You're going to do it for me. When can you start? And I said, you got to be kidding. And uh, he said, I'm not kidding. If you fail, you can always go back and do what you did. So um, I did think about it. And the more I thought about it, I thought, gee, he might be onto something. And, uh, but I was, you know, at the time, quite distraught because uh, I, I loved everything I did. Fortunately, um, all my pals at Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal couldn't have been nicer. Um, Paul even said to me, you know, in our last conversation as colleagues together, he said, you know, okay, so you go to Bloomberg, after two years, Dow Jones will buy Bloomberg, and you'll be back working for us. <laughs> um, it actually was something Mike Bloomberg proposed by the way, a few years into uh, my being at Bloomberg, he actually did propose to Dow Jones. He said, look, you take over Bloomberg, I'll run the company. And that didn't go down too well with the, the uh, folks running Dow Jones at the time, but there was, in fact, uh, a, an idea like that. And uh, who knows? Anyway, what we set out to do was essentially what that first conversation was about. Relative value, context and perspective, real time. Um, tomorrow's news today, those are all sort of empty phrases without me filling in a few things. What did that mean? It meant that in the last decade of the 21st century, where you had access, at least at Bloomberg, to all kinds of data, you could provide much more context instantly for all those calendar-driven events like economic figures, instead of just uh, spitting uh, headlines at 8.30 when the Commerce Department would release a figure, you could have 850 words. So the reader in Frankfurt, where it was 2.30, would have a real story, a narrative, before he or she went home, uh, which was unthinkable. And you could do it for every calendar-driven event. You could do it for not just economic figures, you could do it for corporate earnings and things like that. You could do it for even political events where you know what's on the calendar. That's the easy stuff, you know, that you could pick up. And you could do it all. And you could be very smart about it. And you could give people something that they thought they were only going to get tomorrow when they read their newspaper. So it kind of anticipated the era that we're in. Uh, you know, Bloomberg is a real-time product. And Bloomberg News was born four years before Netscape if you recall, really introduced the internet to all of us, uh, wasn't Al Gore, it, was, um, it, it wasn't Microsoft, it was Netscape, really, that, that you know, showed us uh, the World Wide Web. And um, Bloomberg was essentially doing all those things in its first four years, and um, with data always there as uh, this great resource to see things, and especially relative value, and I'll just, you know, put it on fast forward to where we are today. Examples of, uh, you know, how valuable that is. Um, one example in particular this year. You may recall in January, this new government came to power in Athens. And for the better part of, shall we say, seven months, eight months uh, of this year, uh, the story all the time was Greece. And increasingly the story was that Greece would default because this government was so anti-austerity and was so opposed to any of the agreements that the previous government had uh, accepted that it would default and it would leave the euro. And if you read your newspaper, your online favorite uh, electronic newspaper, magazine, your favorite television broadcast, wherever you went, the story was pretty much the same that it was bad for Greece. And you had people like uh, um, Alan Greenspan in February say it's only a matter of time before um, you know, Greece defaults and the euro uh, disintegrates. You had um, you know, people like uh, George Soros say Greece is going down the drain. He told that to Bloomberg News in uh, March. You had um, 
you know, people who said that, um, like Paul Krugman, that it is hopeless in the New York Times. And yet, if you looked at two numbers all through the year, from the end of 2014 right to the present, two really simple numbers, you couldn't possibly come to that conclusion that everybody pretty much had embraced, at least in the media, pundits, and so forth. And the two figures were the bid and ask of a 10-year Greek bond. And the bid and ask, even when there was not much of a market, but there always was some kind of market, showed you that at its worst, in July of this year, the yield was only 19%. I say only, it's a big number, 19%. But 19% is a lot less than the 28% that it fetched in 2012, when the euro really was in much more serious shape. Um, and the year it you know, started with, um, with the yield at about 11, because everybody was afraid of this new government. Uh, it had been as low as eight and a half the end of 2014. Today, if you, you look at it, it's um, just a little bit north of eight. So from 19% to 8%, per, 8%, 19% is the worst point in July to 8% uh, today was uh, 792, I think, uh, last week. You doubled your money, and Greece is the best investment of anything in the year 2015. It beat everything. Okay, so there you have just, you know, some data points, but it shows you just how important markets are um, when writing about all kinds of things. And why are markets important? Because markets are not ideological. They're just a collection of buyers and sellers seeking relative value, cheap and expensive. And uh, that's a very good, good thing for journalists to remember because when you're thinking about what's the relative value of something, at least you're getting closer to being accurate about what's what and why what's what. So anyway, that was sort of how we got going at Bloomberg and you know, you know sort of the rest. We got pretty big, you know, 2,500 of us. Uh, finally got around to winning a Pulitzer Prize uh, this year and uh, uh, 25 years for me was uh, time enough to be editor-in-chief and uh, now I'm what Mike calls editor-in-chief emeritus. Um, I wake up every day, I have a great uh, life. Uh, I do essentially three things. I uh, travel a lot around the world, engaging what we call newsmakers, um, but not with your standard set of questions from a very educated uh, group of people. It's more with data. Every time we do uh, these interviews, um, and I often do them with, with colleagues wherever we are in bureaus everywhere, is to try to find the data that um, often is surprising to the people we're interviewing, often takes prevailing assumptions and turns them on their head. I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, in January, we were with Governor Jerry Brown, who just, as you know, uh, started his fourth term um, as governor. And we're sitting with him, and uh, the first slide he sees on a Bloomberg is credit default swap prices uh, for U.S. states, for the big U.S. states, major U.S. states. And he looks at this screen and he says, what is this, some casino-like speculative instrument? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, Governor, this is a perception of your state's creditworthiness. And the reason why it's relevant to you is in the past four years, your state or your credit default swap has moved the most in value of any state in the country. You're not the best, but you've improved more than any other state. Well, that started the conversation. Um, and then, you know, and then we showed them, you know, uh, companies in California, big and small alike. Uh, Russell 2000, Standard & Poor's 500, Russell 3000, didn't matter which index we took of companies domiciled in California. We said, okay, you have to answer all the time to people like George Will who say you've got the highest taxes in the country and you've got the most regulation. And you hear that over and over again. And the assumption is that must be bad for business, right? High taxes, most regulation. Well, it turns out over five years, over two years, over one year, year to date, 
by any investment measure you look at, companies domiciled in California outperform companies domiciled in every single state in the country. And that's a fact. And there are lots of facts like that. When we were talking to Michelle Bachelet, president of Chile, said that, you know, since 2006, when she was elected the first time, the Chilean peso was the most stable currency of the 31 most actively traded currencies in the world. So there are lots of things that one can find in the data. It's just a question of, you know, how to put them together and how to put the data points together. So that's one thing that I do. Another thing I do is I got back to writing again. David Shipley, uh, who is the uh, editor for Bloomberg View, our editorial opinion section, came to me in March and said, why don't you start writing? I said, okay, that's nice of you to ask. And uh, so I try to do a column regularly about uh, just what I'm talking about. What does the data show us about things? And there are just some wonderful uh, opportunities, let me call them that, that uh, like Greece, uh, but um, that one can see in data. Um, you know, the uh, a column that I'm working on uh, has to do with credit ratings. And when it comes to sovereigns, um, they're actually contrary indicators, meaning that um, if you bought U.S. debt when it was downgraded on, uh, on August 5th, uh, 2011, or you bought France when it was downgraded in 2012, or you bought Japan when it was downgraded. It was actually a great buying opportunity every time. Um, so the ratings are, at least in that sense, uh, not particularly useful, at least not useful the way they're meant to be. Um, so that's the second thing I do. And then the third thing that I'm doing is, uh, is more philanthropic and um, educational but it's all about journalism, which is um, how to take the profession that we're in, which is still mostly white. Um, we've somehow managed to make a lot of progress on the gender imbalance, and that's really good, but it's still not in any way integrated to the extent that it should be. And so I'm spending more, t I'm spending more time on ventures in Africa and ventures here to make the pipeline for the best and the brightest um, look a bit more diverse, a little bit more like the UN coming into business and financial journalism. So why don't I leave it there, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, having been a person who I suspect, like a lot of people in this room, wasn't a math major, <clears throat> It's, I'm just so glad there's somebody who can make sense of all of these numbers. And uh, I, I just have one question, and then Mike Candell is going to run around the room with a microphone and take questions from all of you, and I know a lot of you do have, have questions. But uh, the market has been a little crazy in the past few weeks. And those of us who, uh, you know, really depend a lot on investments and things to keep us afloat. Some of us are in the arts, and God knows. Anyway, uh, but a lot of people here are retired, and this is important, and you earn nothing on interest, uh, and you watch the stocks go, oh, my God. Um, so do you have anything to impart on us as to how desperate the American economy is at this point in time? Well, maybe you'll forgive me for saying a woman can do it better. Um, but truth be told, I actually did write a column about this. Uh, if you look at the uh, first 15 months of the Janet Yellen-led Fed, the volatility in equities and debt is much less, even with all the turmoil that you're talking about, um, than it was under either of her two predecessors. Um, Alan Greenspan, who you know served for 20 years, Ben Bernanke more recently. He, of course, had to literally do it through the financial crisis where the volatility was the worst. Um, having said that, though, 15 months is a long time already. And uh, based on that measure, she's doing a pretty good job. Uh, and uh, I would say that I'm not an economist, so it's totally inappropriate for me to even comment about, you know, where things are headed. I'm really just a newspaper man. That's all they I do. All one anyway. um, but I would say that, you know, when you look at the data, uh, this was another column. Um, one of the stories that was missed 
in the summer's headlines of uh, plummeting stock markets around the world, plummeting commodity markets around the world, and Donald Trump uh, dominating the presidential race was that uh, the, the biggest ports in America, uh, Long Beach, Los Angeles, um, it's actually Los Angeles number one, Long Beach number two, um, Newark, New York number three, and Savannah, um, Georgia, are um, receiving record traffic. So stuff coming into the United States from all over the world, electronics, clothes, uh, raw and processed uh, materials, you name it, is at a record. 2015 is going to be a record for the stuff coming into the United States. Now that can only happen because the demand is coming from the American consumer who actually does have um, a bit more cash to spend since oil plummeted about 53% since June of 2014. Um, and the American producer, the manufacturer, is able to operate, make things much more efficiently um, with a lower cost of energy as well. So you have this almost harmonic convergence between the consumer and the producer. Now that's just data that I observe. So, um, you know, w why else would the Federal Reserve be poised to raise interest rates if things weren't looking pretty good? The only time when the Fed gets ready to raise interest rates is when the economy gets better. And even now, you know, they're obviously trying to be very careful about it because even as unemployment has declined from 10% at its peak in, uh, in uh, 2009 to 5.1% now, uh, you know, the Fed is still looking at lack of wage growth, relative lack of wage growth and things like that. However, it's not clear that uh, we should all be so um, frightened by what we're seeing because compared to what we've seen in previous years, I can say this having lived through it and written about it, it doesn't look as bad to me, but that's just one observer. So I have a follow-up question to what Betsy asked you. So why is the stock market down so much? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, that's not my, you know, responsibility, really. I can't tell you. Why is it down so You know, stock, nothing goes up in a straight line. And I guess what I would say is if you look at what happened since March of 2009, you know, to earlier this year, it was almost straight up. I mean, there was a hiccup in 2011 in the stock market, but it was really an unbelievable bull market if you look at where we were, where we've come from to present. And so those of us who just pay attention to what happens in history, you look at what's going on today, this year, and you say, well, this is kind of normal for a market to, as they say, retrace its steps a bit. Um, and that would be my answer to you. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not conveying a lot of alarm. Well, J.P. Morgan used to say stocks tend to. J.P. Morgan used to say stocks tend to fluctuate. <laughs> Matt, over the last uh, 20 years or so, how has Mike changed, and how has his decision making changed? Um, the one thing that I kind of picked up when I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Um, talking to Mike Bloomberg, observing him, and trying to put the man then, in, it was, you know, 1988 when I met him for the first time. Um, and one thing I noticed about his life was that uh, if there was one thing that was a constant, it was that he was constantly changing. That he was, what I mean by changing, I don't mean his personality or what he believed in his values, but I mean, he was somebody who was constantly learning. Um, that he, you know, he loves being around people because he loves to learn new things. He loves to learn. And I think that um, we all know where he's been since he uh, decided to run for mayor. Um, and he's learned a hell of a lot, to say the least. Um, he's a real man of the world and knows all the important people in the world and knows about a lot of important issues, many of which he didn't know when I first met him. So that just puts in context uh, who the man is. He's somebody who never stops learning. And so for me, it's always been a thrill because, uh, you know, it's definitely never a dull moment. So how has it changed the way he makes decisions? 
I think, you know, Mike, uh, in, in some ways, hasn't uh, changed too much that way. I mean, once he makes up his mind about people, he's a big believer in the people that he uh, delegates to. Uh, he leaves it to them to make the decisions, and uh, he's got a very famous uh, refrain, which is not publishable on a family channel, <laughs> about, you know, don't screw it up. Um, but that's pretty much what he, what he believes, is uh, keep, you know, work as hard as you can, be as smart as you can, and don't screw it up. Hi, um, I am sorry, my dad. Could you um, reflect on why Mr. Bloomberg declined to run for president? No, I can't, because only he can comment on that and be but inappropriate. You, but you knew, you knew him well, you knew him intimately. Uh, look, uh, truth be told, I, I said this the other day, uh, I was one of the people at Bloomberg who said running for mayor was a terrible idea. Now, um, I said that purely out of self-interest because I didn't want him to leave Bloomberg, not because of whether I thought he would be a good mayor or not. So I'm the last person you should ask on this. Uh, Mr. Happy Reporter at the Wall Street Journal, sir. Uh, what made you so happy, but even uh, more than that, uh, you said you're not an economist and all that sort of stuff. What was your background in uh, in college and all that that okay. got you into this whole thing? Well, I've always I said I'm a newspaper man. It's really true. I, you know, my first job, uh, age 11, was um, delivering what is I think called the Westchester Rockland Journal News. It was then the Rockland Journal News and. I had a little business, and uh, my business was delivering newspapers every day. And um, I kind of got hooked um, because I had to read them, not just distribute them. And um, while I was in college, I uh, started working on a newspaper, a real newspaper, not just my college newspaper, which I edited. And uh, I sort of felt, gee, you know, uh, I get to ask all the questions. Somebody cuts me a check at the end of the week. This is a great way to go through life. And while I was in college, the newspaper that I thought was the best written and the best edited in English was the Wall Street Journal, which didn't run any pictures in those days. Uh, Kenyon College. And, um, and so, uh, you know, a couple years out of Kenyon, I decided... Uh, not knowing anybody to apply for a job at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I was then working for another uh, newspaper, um, has the distinction, I th it was called the Daily Bond Buyer, it's still going, has the distinction, I think, during the New York City uh, fiscal crisis in the 70s. I think Gerald Ford, of all people, said, this is the dullest newspaper in America. Uh, <laughs> um, that's where I worked. Anyway, my lunch hour, I, 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 went, I went uptown, uh, uptown, I went, I went up about 10 blocks, to uh, the Wall Street Journal, and I gave uh, Pat Malloy, who was then, I think, head of, well, they didn't call it human resources then, personnel, I think they called it, and I gave her my uh, resume and uh, clips, and I got back a letter like a week later from the then managing editor of the journal who said, dear Mr. Winkler, we have no openings for you now or in the future. <laughs> So, so I, so I, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I said, okay, well, was, that's not a good start, but uh, I'll try them in six months. And then I got a phone call uh, two weeks after that from the New York bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal said, you may have gotten a letter, um, ignore it. And uh, he said, can you come for an interview? And, and I said, yeah, and, and we interviewed and, he said, okay, in six months, I think there may be something. Are you willing to wait that long? And I said, sure. And so six months later, almost to the day, um, I went to work at the Wall Street Journal, and I couldn't have been happier. Um, and, uh, yeah, and got better from that point on. So, Matt, um, during your tenure at Bloomberg, every, every time I went around the country and the world and – and um, asked, uh, you know, how are your competitors doing? And people would point to entire buildings. I remember one in Japan where you'd bought a small bank building and were hiring like 20 people a week. And um, uh, 
you know, it, it marched on and on and on, and you built a journalism empire with you know, like 2,000 people or, or more. And with all the troubles in the, the journalism business, this seemed to go on, you know, unbroken. But recently, Bloomberg has, um, you know, I don't know how many people, but but there's, um, but a significant number of, of um, people that they uh, shut down. What should we be telling our children and grandchildren about the journalism business if even Bloomberg can be shaken this way? Well, I wouldn't um, jump to conclusions based on any headlines this year about us, uh, other than to say what I've always said, something that I say, uh, used to say with uh, something called Weekly Notes, which I used to write every week, mostly just to <laughs> dissect what we were doing well and what we weren't doing as well as we should. Um, and that is the best is yet to come, and that is definitely true at Bloomberg. Uh, you know, it's inappropriate of me to talk about decisions that are being made, not by me, by, by other people. I really have a happy life, real truly happy life now, because I don't have to make any decisions about things like that anymore. Uh, I just get to decide what I think is interesting, or people who are interesting uh, for whatever reason, and then pursue them, or topics. Um, but having said all that, what I would say this about us, um, we're actually, uh, ha we're actually had the best month in terms of uh, sales uh, last month, and I think this month is going to, coming month, October, may even be better. Um, and uh, the business that is Bloomberg is actually going to keep growing, as it has uh, every year that I've been at Bloomberg. And uh, as I've often said, the best is yet to come. Uh, Matt, uh, yeah, uh, Jerry Eskenazi. Uh, when you're watching the debates, do you think as, uh, as a newspaper per person, and if so, what are some of the thoughts that you have in terms of how the uh, analysts uh, d describe the candidates and how they describe themselves in terms of economics? You know, that's such a uh, good question. Um, good for me because I did watch the last debate, um, and you know, I was I had come into the office uh, afterwards after the last debate, and I was minding my own business at my desk. Um, and uh, I'm on a new floor now with some of the executives I've been kicked upstairs. And, uh, but I was, you know, trying to be uh, as discreet as possible. And one of my colleagues comes and says, oh, did you see the debates last night? And they're all talking about it. And what do you think? What do you think? And somebody says, oh, I thought it was great. And then comes this query, Winkler, what did you think? And, uh, and I said, I thought it was awful. Uh, I said, really awful. It was depressing. And uh, why? why? Why did you think it was awful? I said, because how long did it go? An hour and a half? It was too long anyway, but three hours, whatever. It was so long. I said, so many things were said that weren't true, aren't true, and the journalist among them didn't even say, are you sure? You want to say it that way. Are you sure that's what you saw? Um, and that didn't happen. And I do remember in the last time, the last election, you know, Candy Crowley did actually, uh, maybe she should have asked a question and just said, no, he did say it, uh, instead of correcting Romney, a candidate Romney. But at least she was doing her job uh, as she's supposed to, I think, as a journalist. So I. I was very um, disheartened, to say the least, as a journalist. What about him? Well, again, you know, it's not for me to, you know, give an opinion on this other than, you know, the, the American politics is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Matt, very final question. What do you think of the Wall Street Journal under Rupert Murdoch? Well, I read it every day, so that tells you uh, enough right there. It's the no, first. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. I, uh, it's you know, I wake up every morning. It's what I read first. So there. Thank you. We have we have a habit here and an honor. 
for our speakers, making them members of the Silurians. It's about time you joined this august group of seasoned veteran journalists. We would be happy to have your presence. Uh, we have some good meetings coming up. You have the next one uh, on the third Wednesday of October is going to be a uh, fellow you've heard of, Bill Keller, talking about the Marshall Project, somebody who's right. been an executive doing interesting things. And um, thank you very much. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of announcements. Whoa, 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 no, don't run away yet. I, I want you to remember, uh, we have name tags. Mary Jane, where's Mary Jane? Right back there, Mary Jane Crook, thank you for doing the name tags. We have a big bowl back there, silver bowl by the door. Put your name tags in them or I will personally come and strangle you because uh, we don't want to have to make them all over again. We like to reuse them. Uh, I think we're good. You may hear from, ah, uh, one thing. You may hear from me by emails over the next month or so, but I regret to tell you I'm going to have to miss the next meeting. Uh, I would really like to be there because I'd love to hear Bill Keller, but I'm going to be on my honeymoon. And I could not work all of this out uh, and avoid, you know, you wanted to have a decided date we're going to do the third Wednesdays for these lunches and I had a conflict and as much as I would like to hear him I'm not coming back from Umbria for the occasion <laughs> but at any rate uh, great to see you all I did you enjoy the lunch yes. tastes good all right most of you will see each other again in October I'll be thinking about you uh, we've got a great season coming up and uh, you're going to have the Silurian news coming out pretty soon. So good things are happening. See you again soon.